supporting women travelers. So Jordan, take it away. All right. Let me go ahead and share my screen, y'all. How's everyone doing? Hello, hello. I saw someone from Rockville here. Um, and I also saw someone who I know I has been peeking around at some of the in-person events, but I've yet to meet in person. I've also been traveling a lot. So if you have tried to attend one of the in-person events and I missed you, I'm sorry, but I'm here all summer for the rest of the summer, if you can believe it. Okay. All of that aside, um, global debauchery, how to create a killer brand experience. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you, Leah, for hosting me. Thank you, Nomadic Network, for having me. So when we're done here, you're going to know a little bit more about yours truly, what a brand actually is, how to define your brand, how to identify your niche, how to find your voice, how to create a strong visual identity, how to put together a killer brand guide, media kit, and ultimately how to get business results, right? Because that's the end game for all of us. So my name is Jordan Campbell. I'm a travel blogger. I'm a third culture kid based out of DC Metro. I am an off the beaten path flash packer and road tripper. Um, now I've been 55 countries, all 50 states. And uh, I usually start my travels with a drink in hand at the airport, hence global debauchery. Plus I just love taste, like testing out all the tasty libations wherever I go. Um, I've presented previously on the Nomadic Network. Um, I've spoken at the Travel and Adventure Show, and um, as Leah said, I'm the wonderful membership director as well. Um, you can follow me at Global Debauchery on most of the main social platforms, and you can subscribe to my newsletter as well for travel inspo and fun discounts. So this is my current life. However, many people do not know that I was also in my former life an award-winning designer and creative director. So I actually have more than 20 plus years experience um, branding and building multi, you know, million dollar websites with companies such as MasterCard, Blue Cross, Penn State, University of Maryland. Um, you can take a look at my portfolio if you would like to, jordan-campbell.com. Uh, but I have a disclaimer that like most blogs and portfolios, it needs it needs updating. Um, and much of my focus is currently on my blog. I do do lots of design stuff as well, just to supplement my income, but I am working on transitioning that. Um, so it's important to know when we think about what is a brand, I think a lot of people believe that a brand is just the way something looks, right? And that's not just it. It is everything. Every interaction in any form is branding. That means my background is a brand. The color of my shirt is a brand, essentially. Like none of this is by accident. Um, nothing in my PowerPoint is not branded. Um, the way you speak to people, your voice, the way you write. All of that plus your visual is what creates a brand. So that being said, we're going to kind of take it back a notch and start at the basics by defining your brand. It's important to ask yourself the following questions. And this is a baseline. Before you do anything, before you do anything else with your existing brand, make sure you know the answers to all of these. Um, write them down, put them aside, circle back to them repeatedly. But so ask yourself the following questions. What are you doing? <laughs> what is it that you're doing at all? Like, what, what is your mission? What is it that you're going to communicate over and over about? Who are you even talking to? What's your audience? Who are your personas? What is it you're offering that others don't? What are your key differentiators or your value adds? Uh, what can you zero in on where you can gain more traction? Um, and this goes to niche and content pillars. What's your communication style? Uh, we'll talk about brand archetypes, brand descriptors, your voice, and, and ultimately, who are you? What is your brand story? What is your elevator pitch? Um, and what are your goals? In other words, like after all of this, you need to be sure that you're authentic to you and that this is fulfilling to you. And if it's not, it's not going to be sustainable. So you need to repeatedly come back to your goals and who you are and see some alignment and check your results as well. So it's, it is hugely about everybody else and what they're taking in from your content, but it's also about whether it's sustainable for you just being you, right? Because all of us are bloggers or content creators in our own, in our own rights. So first things first, like let's talk about mission. What, what are you doing? What's your mission? And the simplest way to do this is I help blank do blank. 
That is literally whatever your mission statement is, keep it short, sweet, intentional. Do not pad it with a bunch of excess confusion and noise. And at the end of the day, everything that you do should be circling back to this mission. Everything should feed it. If it's not feeding it, it's degrading it. Just remember that it has an effect whether you think it does or not. Um, and just as an example, my mission is I help travelers travel deeper. So I am an off the beaten path traveler. Um, you really need to hone in on who are you talking to? What is your audience? What is your persona? The easiest way, of course, to do this is to pull analytics from your blog and social accounts. This is going to be your audience. You know, check out the ages, check out the genders, check out your locations. These are the people that you're talking to that are already hooked on your content. And it's important to acknowledge that you need to meet them where they're at and you need to give them what they want and need in order to keep them, right? Um, and part of this for me, and this is something even I personally have struggled with a little bit. So I am a young Gen Xer. Um, I'm not trying to be a, I don't know, go out in the desert in ball gowns, you know, <laughs> and do photo shoots, you know, kudos, kudos to people who do, but that's just not my travel style. And I'm also not trying to be like significantly younger than I am online either. Um, so I have to meet the older millennial Gen X crowd. That doesn't mean that I can't talk to anybody else. If I'd like to talk to somebody else, you can create a persona, which is basically like your, or personas, plural. Uh, you create and envision a general idea of what your exact person is, who you're speaking to exactly. Like if you could put it in a box as one person, define who that person is. And then if you, if that persona is not your audience, you need to shift your strategy and assess your analytics. And this could be things like your look and feel, the way you talk, the things you reference, or like what content you even kind of produce and all of your social media channels. You know, I, I don't expect, for example, um, a lot of Gen Z to go over to traditional blogs. They're looking at blogs. They're not going to Facebook. They're going to TikTok. You know, so you need to address all of that. And for me personally, like, I don't want any more, this is just being honest, I don't want any more social media platforms to take care of, right? I have too many. So I don't see as an example, like, TikTok is going to be something I adopt, even though I know how hugely successful it is. I just don't know that it's going to be sustainable content for me personally and my audience. And my audience too, weirdly, I have a love-hate relationship with IG and Facebook. I have really ridiculous Facebook engagement. And it's because a lot of my audience is mid, mid 40s, older 50s too, right? So they engage away over there. So these are all things. What's your mission? Who are you talking to? Don't like who you're talking to? Create a persona. <laughs> what's your with them? Uh, with them is in marketing, it's the what's in it for me. Um, and again, things to think about from the outset before you do anything else. What's your key differentiator? So the fact of the matter is, you know, we can't all be nomadic, Matt, right? We can't all be like super broad, uh, have very broad traveling sites that are wildly successful. Um, we need to find something that makes us different, stand out from the crowd a little bit more. So what is your key differentiator? Um, I like to consider mine, my voice. I am very, <laughs> um, I guess a little counterculture in the way I talk about things and the things I go see and the things I like to do. Um, and even brutally honest, my communication style. And I think this is one thing that separates me a lot is that it's just more of an informal conversational tone. Um, what's your value add? You need to be sure that every single thing that you post is adding value. Do not go on Instagram and just basically post like, hey, this happened to me, like, you know, so, sorry, but to put, like, who cares? Why do people care about what, what happened to you that day? You need to give them something, give them information, give them a tip, give them something to walk away with. Um, and ask yourself, is this what your audience even wants? And again, is this what you want to give your audience? All of that needs to be in alignment. So, Another aspect of this is creating viability with your brand. You need to give your brand growth opportunities up front or it's not going to be successful. So this is a question of what's your niche. And again, like you can't expect to come into the world competing with Nomadic Matt. Find a niche. Um, find a little facet that is your facet where you can happily live and you can create an attentive, engaged audience. 
define your content pillars. What are the main things? Usually three or four. Um, I wouldn't go more than that, but what are the main things that you're consistently talking about that are drawing people in? What do people know they can go to you for and nobody else, right? Um, they don't want to visit your page and see like a mishmash of stuff all over the place. They're coming to you because they value your input on these specific things. So you need to define what your content pillars are. Good questions to ask up front too. Is enough content even there? In other words, if you niche way too small, you are could have a highly engaged audience, but always be a very, very small audience. And in addition to that, where there always be enough new content available in your niche. So I'm trying to think of uh, a good, well, a good example might be COVID, for example. If you like hung your hat on like, I'm the COVID travel know-how person and now COVID's going away. I mean, you're not going to have a whole lot of, you know, new content five years from now. You know, it's going to cycle out and you're not giving yourself an opportunity to stay in the game. Make sense? That's so it's important to note, passion led us here, but Sir, as Sir Richard Branson would say, the way a company brands itself is everything, and it will ultimately decide whether a business survives. And again, this is everything. This is your customer service experience, the way you talk to people, the way you present yourself. So let's go ahead and define your brand voice um, and what your brand archetype is. So I didn't want to zero in on one of these, but you can literally Google brand archetypes. There are technically 12 and they have quizzes all over the place, left and right, um, that you can take that will tell you what your brand archetype is. So I've taken several of those. And what you have in front of you is sort of my amalgamation of a lot of these brand archetypes. And what it does is it sort of gives me something to zero in on and to come back to. Like these are sort of my brand, you know, these are my keywords. These are the things that define my brand. This is my motto. This is how my voice is. These are my values. Um, but if, again, if you go and Google brand archetypes, you can take these quizzes. And this is just a reference to circle back to, like, this is what I want my brand to be. This is what everything needs to serve. So, and you, you can actually see some of my more <laughs> counterculture stuff is in here to rebel, challenge, change. All of that is very much in line with uh, my brand, Global Debauchery. So creating your visual identity, which I suspect is what a lot of people are really excited for <laughs> as part of the brand. Um, but know that it is more than just your logo, your visual identity. Um, if you're having trouble uh, creating your brand, so like I'm a designer by, um, by trade, and I, not everybody is obviously, not everybody can hire, you know, professional designers to come up with a look and a feel. Um, you can go, Canva offers logos now that you can customize. You can go to Fiverr, you can go to Upwork. I haven't used Upwork. I've used Fiverr and I know a lot of people have had mixed feelings about their services, but mine have been good so far. Um, a note as well on the left here that this is an old brand guide, but this is just a reference of what mine looks like behind the scenes. So everything everywhere should be visually branded. This is your profile photos and all your social media platforms, your PowerPoint, your campaign reports, your website, your, you know, everything, everything everywhere should be branded. Um, and you need to de determine your aesthetic. One of the reasons why I have imagery here is because I wanted to really hone in on like what style of photography I'm going to use, like what, what people can look for. Um, is your, the big thing, is your logo legible even? A lot of people love these handwriting fonts and that's great. Obviously, clearly I'm not against using them, but a lot of them are also not very legible. So you have to do a double take. And if a person has to do a double take just to know your business name, that's a problem. Um, does your logo translate well at varying sizes? Do you have different orientations of your logo available? Um, you know, if somebody asks to post your logo somewhere and it's really, really wide and they have a really, really narrow space and your logo is this big, that doesn't bode well for you. And you've just lost an opportunity. Um, and consistency is key. You wanna form a really distinctive aesthetic for yourself. So we're taking all of that information and we're gonna put it all together, right? And the best way to do this is to create a brand guide for yourself. Again, consistency is key. So put everything together in one place and consist, like 
constantly refer back to it when you're creating anything. And this is also really helpful to have if you have, um, for example, if you're like outsourcing some things or VA services, things like that, then they can know everything about your brand and where you stand. Um, your brand guide should include a mission, your brand story, your audience, your differentiators, brand descriptors, those are the archetype um, words. I, I have an elevator pitch in there just so I can say it over and over and over again. Um, usually an intro and about. And of course you wanna have logos, color palette, fonts, and some imagery examples. And I can show you my whole, um, let's see. I can show you my whole suite here. So it's just a couple of pages and you can see got my main logo. I've got some variations of my logo. This is the little icon that goes to the top of your website or on the tab. Um, I've got color palette. I've got fonts. I've got imagery, my mission, my brand story, my introduction, my about me. And a lot of this stuff too, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You'll be asked for a lot of the stuff if you do presentations or if you're working with somebody, you'll be asked for this stuff over and over. So you can literally copy, paste it and give it to them. And you have it all right here. So, so and the fact of the matter is, is if you don't give the market the story to talk about, they'll define your brand story for you. And that is, probably not a great scenario for a lot of people. So I say punch today in the face and get going on your brand and make some things happen. So with all of that, we're going to take that and we're going to prep you guys for pitching. And so I say fake it till you make it. And that doesn't mean that doesn't mean lie, right? It doesn't even mean misrepresent or manipulate. What it means is to act like a professional, be a professional until you are a professional. And so here are some basic things um, when you're beginning to work with brands with your brand. Um, work that elevator pitch, say it over and over and over again. You shouldn't trip over it. You shouldn't follow it. The words should just flow out of your mouth. Uh, whoever wants to, you know, if you're at a conference and you meet a brand, you say, oh, I'm Jordan. I'm a flash packing road tripper with an insatiable appetite for the road less traveled, you know, like, and you can have a couple of versions of it too, um, that are, you know, just to mix it up a little bit. But you want to make sure that you know what your brand is. You want to know it with confidence. You want to know it so you can say it over and over again whenever the opportunity pops up. Um, craft a pitch email template. So I think this is something, yeah, that we have uh, more info on. But craft a pitch email template. Refine and revise as you go along and consistently use it. Craft a media kit. So a media kit is one of the biggest things, I think, that helps you look like a professional more than others. Um, and so your media kit should include things like a brief intro, maybe brands you've worked with, some of your numbers, outline your audience. You want to highlight your strengths, right? Um, we're not all great at everything. So focus on what it is that you're good at and just don't list what it is that you're working on. Um, you want to also make sure you're updating regularly because you never know. Like sometimes, you know, all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, I have to update this super fast for so-and-so. Um, and certain things can cause big dips in, or big dips or rises in your numbers as well. So if you happen to get a big rise, you're going to want to highlight that and really capitalize on it, right? You want to post it on your site. In other words, do not, I mean, put a PDF link as well, but do not just have a PDF link. So when somebody arrives at your site, they can see everything right up front. Um, and you absolutely 1000% want to include your contact info. And I will show you guys mine here as well. So you can see what it is that I'm referring to. So here's my site, for example, and I have work with me, you know, pretty front and center. I also have it up here, a standard work with me page. And you can see right here that I've got my media kit. Now this is also a PDF, one pager. So people can click on the link, they can download it and they can print it as well. So it's there for their convenience, but it is front and center on my site. You do not want to um, bury a link somewhere. You want it to be readily available for the people that you wanna work for. 
So also one thing to consider ahead of time as well, you should research your rates. Now, this is a really tough, always, always, always a really tough area to get into because rates are going to be different for everybody, for all different projects. People are going to have different budgets. Um, I And I personally have yet to actually create a rate card, but I was recently asked for one for the first time. I did not have one. <laughs> so I was like, maybe I should have created a rate card after all. Um, I think a general rule of thumb for social is one cent per per follower. So if you have, I believe that's it. So if you have, or is it more than that? Yes, it's about, so if you have 5,000 followers for like a permanent feed post, for example, maybe a little more for a permanent feed post, you could do somewhere in the range of like 50 bucks to $65 because it's a permanent feed post. But that's sort of a general rule of thumb. And again, they do change based on your engagement, based on your audience, based on who's asking you. So all of those things are things to consider and they're going to be different for everybody. Most of all, just remember, you do not get what you don't ask for. This is like my one of my big mottos in life. Just make the pitch. Just go out and make the pitch because you're not like nobody's going to come and offer you one, right? There's lots of people who want to go out and do the legwork and get the business. Um, just make the pitch. You do not get what you don't ask for. So just go for it. Take the information and go for it. So a little bit about getting some results. So you'll get lots of rejections. I mean, unless you're an anomaly or like, I don't know, adventurous Kate, you know, <laughs> like you're going to get a lot of rejections, you know, just brush it off and keep it moving. It is not personal. And honestly, the more pitches you make, the better you get at it. Uh, it becomes more of a like in your head, recited, well-versed, all of the things, but yeah, definitely don't take it personally. And every now and then, like even do something big, pitch something big because you never know. I've had a couple of like surprising big breaks, you know, and then there are people that I never hear anything from, but just keep on pitching. Um, you can go to, I think one of the biggest things for actually getting results is networking. I've done multiple conferences where that's really where I've met a ton of brands that have that have ultimately led to work. Um, organizations like the Nomadic Network, like Wonderful, um, and Instagram even, you can network on. I know a lot of area influencers and have been like, hey, let's get together and do a collab, right? And people do. Um, if you're willing to put it out there into the universe, people do get back to you, you know, um, and are willing to work together. I think, especially in our field, we can be a like, super collaborative field. Um, you can work on, if you don't have any uh, professional brand experience, you can build your portfolio with collaborations with other bloggers or blog organizations, and even in-kind offers. This was one way I started out. Actually, at the onset of the pandemic, I did a bunch of in-kind offers just, just to build my book and say, hey, here's the work that I've done. Here are the brands that I've worked with. And then I was able to move into paid, um, paid opportunities. Again, refine that pitch over and over and over. Um, go back, see what's working, see what's not working, um, and just keep narrowing it down. One of the biggest things, and again, this will make you appear very professional as well, is to research the company, tailor your pitch. So you have your brand pitch email, right? Your email template. But one of the best things that you can do is actually research the organization. A lot of travel boards will have um, sort of an annual plan, like an uh, annual report or like a forecast that they post openly um, to the world. So you can actually go onto their site and see what it is that they're looking to do and what it is they're looking to level up for the next year. Um, you can even see you know, what their focus is on and if that aligns with you and what you want to do as well. So it definitely sounds more bespoke if you're looking at what their needs are and pitching what they want. Um, Include ideas in your pitch and include specifics. So come to them with an idea up front. Don't make them do the legwork on the idea, right? And include specifics in your ask. Say, this is what I'm looking for in return. This is what I'm looking for, X, Y, Z. In return, I will give you one Instagram post, you know, one reel, a blog post. Like be very specific. Outline quantities, dates, everything. Um, you'll thank me later. But also they like it because they know exactly exactly where they stand and what you're asking for. Always follow up um, and definitely ask for feedback. Don't be too shy to ask for feedback. Um, send a campaign report. I'm actually really bad about sending campaign reports, but there are 
Uh, just an example, I'm working with, which I know some people don't care for, um, Influence Kit, which automates campaigns for you. <laughs> Um, so you can literally just like generate a bunch of stuff and it spits out a report and they're even working on like making it match your brand so you can throw it out there and just send it to brands. And of course, keep in touch. Like once the job is done, don't just, uh, <laughs> have that be the last time you ever talk to anybody, keep in touch. Cause you never know what the opportunities might be. Um, always assess and tweak to what went well. What didn't go so well? What would you do def different next time? But also assess and tweak for yourself. Like, is the direction that you, is this the direction you want your brand going? Was this a good match? Um, what could you do differently? A lot of this, you know, it, you need to keep in mind that the work that you're doing, it's not just for the money, but it's also self-serving to generate more business later, right? So it needs to be strategic work. It shouldn't be just anything, anywhere, whoever's willing to pay. And mostly, and I am also really terrible about this, brag about your successes. If you get a big win, shout it from the rooftops on all of your social media channels. Um, you know, put that new, put that new award up there, put that new brand that you just worked with, like post that, tell people about it, let them know what you've been doing, pump yourself up to your own horn, all of those things. Um, I'm not that great about it, but it looks, it definitely appears to professionals like you're moving in the right direction, like you've got momentum, all of these things. Oh, well, I ran that short. My last, and I have to say up front, my last um, webinar that I did on optimizing uh, a website ran long and was like, everybody was like, my brain is going to explode, right? So I was like, okay, less content this time. So and it's the first time I'm running this one. But uh, let's be friends, follow me at any of these places. If you subscribe to my blog newsletter, there's a pop-up for it. And there's also a sidebar um, where you can um, subscribe to it. Through this Sunday, um, I will send you my pitch email template, my brand guide as reference. And then you also get up to $100 off on your next hotel stay. That's like sort of um, just the general <laughs> offer that goes out through my newsletter. Um, and you can get $50, $50 off a brand consult with me. If you would like me to review your brand, um, email jordan at globaldebauchery.com, subject TNN brand consult. And what I'll do is I'll spend one hour reviewing your brand and coming up with a document and pointers to send off to you. And then we can spend one hour discussing. And the total for those two hours would be 150. And my rate is usually 100 an hour for that. So, and, and as an added, bonus as well. Leah was mentioning wonderful and how it's such an awesome, uh, you know, travel group for women and it has a lot of content creator opportunities as well. I also have a uh, wonderful discount promo code. So if you would like to sign up for that organization as well and get a lot of um, information on content creation, you can use code, promo code Washington DC, all caps, no space. And you would just go to wonderful.com slash join, J-O-I-N, for that as well. And so, yeah, let's please have lots of questions now, because I, <laughs> I have some extra time here, so. No worries. Jordan, what was that? Okay, wonderful.com join, what was the code? It I'm is just Wa dropping it in the chat. Oh, thank you. It's uh, Washington, D.C., all caps, no space. Okay, Washington, D.C. Oh, I love that. Because um, then you know who the referral came from. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, all right, everyone. Because I know some of you may be in the car and listening. So we try to make this as accessible as possible. So I've tried to drop in a lot of Jordan's contact information in the chat, uh, her email, the wonderful code. So if you are looking at the chat, I can't look at the screen. That's what's going on in the chat. Also, hot tip, if you're on Zoom desktop and you're in the chat, three dots at the bottom right-hand corner, click those and hit save chat. And it saves all the good information in the chat, all the stories, advice, tips, et cetera, saves that to the Zoom folder on your desktop. So that's probably like my favorite Zoom trick. All right. Um, let's see. We have a lot of great questions. Let's start okay. with John because he's the first one that I saw. Um, is it better? Is it a better strategy to have this or some of these things first 
before starting an email newsletter. Uh, John doesn't have a consult consistent social media presence or blogging frequency, but keeps getting bogged down with what should be the priority, which I know is a hot topic, right? Yeah, um, I think I would I I would start with um getting your brand down because everything sort of emanates from that right like whatever you do on your blog uh whatever you do on social whatever you do on an email newsletter all of that should be coming from this strategy right you know your brand strategy and ultimately a growth strategy um you know and there are different things as well like obviously you would have like a social growth strategy off of that but it's all about your brand like who you want to be who you're presenting yourself to um, and coupling that as a strategy. So I would absolutely start off with that. I wouldn't get too bogged down because I can say I've changed, you know, my website design and brand. Like it should definitely be something that's organic, like every few years, not enough to confuse people, but certainly enough to be like refreshed and, you know, in the now. Um, I'm trying to think of a really bad, <laughs> just brand, you know, from just a big brand that hasn't been updated in forever. And everybody's like, why are they still like that? Like, don't be that brand, but um, don't change it so much that people have no idea who you are either. So it is a careful balance. All right. Okay. So we have a question from Rebecca. Question about rates. Uh, Rebecca has an idea of how to price articles or content that they write about, but a tourism org asked me to explore their city and write about it. How would you price your time for the exploration? It's a good question. Um, I guess I have always personally, and I don't know whether this is, so it's not something that you would be doing anyway. Is that my, is that how I'm understanding it? Like you wouldn't otherwise be writing, um, like you're not already in the city, I guess. This would be um, going into the city and exploring just for them. Okay. Um, I might price that into whatever my other costs are, I guess, because the way, and I'm not, like I said, there's so many different ways to do it. And I am not at the level that like Nomadic Matt is, you know, and some of these other folks. Um, I have yet to, I've charged for a press trip, but not for individual. Like if somebody says, hey, you're gonna go on this excursion, the price point that I give them, like part of it is actually going on the excursion and writing about it. Does that make sense at the same time? So I think if you wanted to get um, paid for the additional time as well for actually doing that, I would kind of pad that into the um, into your pricing. Does anyone Jordan, else are you have other, um, has anyone else actually charged for time for an excursion? And then on top of that, outside of a press trip, I mean, outside of a formal press trip. Wouldn't wouldn't it be standard practice or at least ask for the excursion be comped, mm -hmm. right? Could you do that? All right. Oh, the answer is always no. If you don't ask, so ask everyone because the worst they're going to do. Yeah, no, say no, absolutely, right? <laughs> absolutely do not pay. Like if somebody asks you and wants you to write an article about something that you wouldn't otherwise be doing, you should absolutely be getting paid for that article, but also they should be paying for that excursion itself. Um, I was thinking in the mindset of like the time you spend doing it, but yeah, absolutely. Um, either in kind um, where they're covering everything um, or for the product itself. Um, Rebecca, I've only ever had them pay for my time as well when I've been on a press trip. So, and they pay for everything. They pay for certain meals, they pay for your stay, they pay for your flights, and then you get paid on top of that. Um, so for example, if somebody's like, hey, I want you to review this product and um, post it on Instagram, the post, the price that I'm giving them is not just for the post itself, but also for the time that I'm putting into creating the post. And it would be the same with blog, I think. I hope that helps. And if anyone has different feedback, by all means, chime in, because it's such a, um, you know, right now is the era of the micro-influencer and all the rules have changed and all the rules are all over the place, so. <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, there are people out there, you know, teaching creators, including yourself, Jordan, how to work with brands. If you have under like a thousand followers across all your social media platforms. So, uh, you're a little frozen, but I, I, I think you'll come back in a few seconds. <laughs> um, and if anyone else has any stories or tips, feel free to, um, you know, drop them in the chat. 
or respectfully come off mute if no one else is chatting. I don't want us clamoring over each other, but am I back? Yes. Yes. You're back. back. Great. I was just about to leave the room and come back in. Oh no. (laughs) Doing that. So Sarah wants to know about your photography and photo process. Who takes your photos? What equipment do you use? What's the best way to get on brown on brand photos of yourself while traveling? So I actually do all of my own photography and I kind of think that's one of, so all of these are mine. <laughs> these are mine and um, everything on my blog is mine. And I like to think of that as one of my key differentiators, not in a, I guess it is in a selling sense as well. Um, it's sort of part of, I never wanted for me personally, my brand to be um, sort of standard, uh, like very informational, like very dry content. I never wanted my photography to be like just another photo of Rome or something, you know, I really wanted to give it um, personality. And so I really, and I enjoy off the beaten path stuff, right? So a lot of my photography is very gritty. Um, I do a lot of photography of street art and a lot of photography, you know, I, I try to keep it a lot of city photography, things like that. Um, and honestly, I I use I do know Photoshop, so I use you know I'm trained in Photoshop, so I do use that. But I think Lightroom does quite a lot of things that you can use. Um, you can create your own filters. You can buy a filter if you would like. Just make sure you don't overblow it. Um, I see a lot of overblown photography on like Instagram, and it's just not doing any justice for the photo itself. Um, I work with a Nikon, like a gigantic camera. But the fact of the matter is, is now that I, I have the newest iPhone, you know, I, it's almost like I use my iPhone for everything and I hardly ever take my Nikon out and it's just become really heavy and not convenient. So keep in mind, you know, it's not always about, you know, my professional photographer friends would probably kill me for saying this, but, you know, photography is an art unto itself, of course, but it's not all, always about the camera, right? It's about the eye. It's about the um, the perspective. It's about viewing the world in a different way. And it's also just about quality. Like I said, I see a lot of really blown out like orange and turquoise and where you can't see anything and very beachy. And I'm not sure that, you know, that's always the... <laughs> the way to go. And two, you want to differentiate yourself. If you see a whole bunch of people using a certain kind of filter, like maybe you don't want to be using that one, you know, just be another person lost in the mix. So I think that was, I think, were there additional questions in there? It was like a multi-part question. (laughs) Yeah. uh, I kind of threw in additional questions for people who (laughs) may have been wondering. Um, Yeah. Sarah was saying struggle getting photos do, do you use um, tripods, Jordan? I do have like a little, I have a big tripod. I don't travel with that one. And I have one mm-hmm. of the little ones with the um, the twisty legs on it as well. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah. One of the things that for my brand specifically <laughs> is that I don't love, um, I don't love selfies um, a lot. So I don't take a lot of selfies. I just don't. Like I've decided like this is something I'm just going to own about my brand is, um, you know, I like, looking at the world every now and then I want to pop in a photo and just let people know who I am (laughs) right and um have a voice but I don't tend to have a lot of like me standing in front of xyz and so it just at all honestly I probably wouldn't be the absolute best person um for that to answer that question but I mean people do content creators do a lot of amazing things nowadays you know Tips and and if you have a affiliate, if you have an affiliate link for the tripods you use, please drop them in here. We'd love to support you that way too. Oh, I just ordered two tripods for uh, Bali. I'm heading there next week and I'm going to debate which one uh, I'm bringing. They're like, they expand to six feet. I only have a small 12 inch one. So we'll see how this goes. Um, I'm going to scroll back up a little bit here. Uh, Farha or Farah. I'm so sorry if I'm butchering your name, has a question. If you've gone on a press trip or excursion for a brand and later wanted to write something from that experience for another magazine, do you need to inform the first brand about it? That's a really good question. Um, I, I think I would inform them about it just to be like nice, I guess. But I mean, at the end of the day, it's your, that is a good question. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think, because it is a fine line. I would let them know 
feel the room around. I don't think that you can really like put intellectual property parameters on like going somewhere. Like that doesn't seem, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> You're right. Right. It's true. But I, I do think that if they paid you for certain content and you've provided that content to them in good faith and they're happy, you should be able to write additional content. Not only that, if you got an offer to write for someplace else, like they should be about what you did with them. They should be overjoyed, right? Like, wouldn't that be the response? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just that they're mm -hmm. like, wow, we got even more, you know, press out of what we took this person on than we were expecting. Like, oh my gosh, we're going to be in Fodor's or Forbes or something, you know, yeah. on top of. Um, what is it? All press is good press, something like that. Kind of, yeah, it's kind of my <laughs> thought. I mean, I would just try to be, I would try to be thoughtful, but yeah, I just feel like they, you know, they can't put parameters on your experience in one place or, you know, another. Mm -hmm. that, would, mm -hmm. that would seem weird to me. Right, right. But on content, okay. yes, like on specific content they pay you for. That's one of the reasons though why mm -hmm. I would say it's very important that you're super specific mm -hmm. in your pitch and what you agree to. I agree to X, Y, Z, here is X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. And then everything outside of that, you know, is yours. For example, your photography, like they don't necessarily own all of the photography that you do and post just because you took it on their trip. Mm -hmm. But you may agree to send them like four or five photos as mm -hmm. part of your package them. Yep. And then don't you, after that, don't you have to, to get, get into like licensing and usage <laughs> rights and fees? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can. And that's tricky as well because it's yeah different between print and digital and, yep. um, you know, exposure, like who's going to yep. be seeing it, where, um, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, thank you. That's a, that's great insight. So thank you. Let's move to Andy's question. Andy um, asked, you talked about defining your brand's mission and that everything you do should circle back to that mission. So for Andy, he says, I see a potential tension between staying consistent, posting content on social media and staying laser focused on the mission. So do you have any guidelines on how flexible to be about staying on message for my niche versus being more general about travel to post more? Um, well, I think that's where you come up with your content pillars, right? And that's where you define your niche and you come up with your content pillars, the things that you're going to talk about. It doesn't mean you can't ever, you know, just have a day where you're like, this is what I'm doing. But if you do that, make sure that you're giving your audience value. I think the more and more that you veer off track from that message, the more followers you're going to lose um, because they start going, this person isn't, they're no longer what I came here for and what I liked about them to begin with, right? But also that's where we talked about um, making sure there's enough content in your niche and in your pillars and making sure that you're going to be able to sustain creating content in that pillar and that niche. Um, so I hope that answers the, hope that answers the question. So Jordan, can you, and uh, forgive me if you already explained this, I don't know if you did, but what are your, like, say you have three to five content pillars. Did you drop those in your presentation? What are yours so that we can get like a example? So mine are, my niche is offbeat travel. Um, that's kind of where I settle in um, and female offbeat travel. So additionally, my content pillars are offbeat travel, um, road tripping and oh, drinks around the world. <laughs> so there we go. Um, global debauchery actually, and something I've been thinking of incorporating back into my blog. Actually, you guys can tell me what you think right here. <laughs> Um, so global debauchery actually started because at the beginning of every trip, I would always take, you know, there was this like mad rush, mad dash when I was working crazy hours and you get to the airport and you go through check-in and you sit in DC traffic, like all this stuff. And you finally get to your gate and your flight's there and you have like a half hour to kill. Right. And so I'd be like, where's the bar? Um, so where is the airport bar? And I'm going there and I'm just going to have a beer before takeoff. And it ended up that I would always like take a picture of my drink with my passport and my ticket. And that was sort of the start. That was the official start of every trip. And I still do it. Um, my husband does it with me now. It's a thing. His parents even know, like text us. They're like, where's, where's your uh, traditional pre-flight libation, you know, <laughs> picture. So that was one thing I always posted before on my travels is like, Hey, a new trip's coming up on Instagram. And I'm kind of thinking of incorporating that back. I stopped doing it because I was like, it's a picture of a beer, you know, but I'm like, it's also just a fun part of my blog that I do. And, and I circle back to a lot of, um, 
drinks around the world and trying to, you know, wines mm -hmm. here or there or distilleries here or there, or, you know, wherever I go in whatever country, like this is the traditional drink there. Um, yeah. So, so those are my content pillars that I try to stick to. And um, it's about consistency, right? In, in every sense of the word. So even if you feel like that doesn't fit into your brand, which it does for you, luckily, but like, that's what people know you as just like, oh, she posts a drink every time she takes off. I can't even drink before I get on a flight. So <laughs> I admire that. I know I can't, I get the ma most massive headache. So I stay away from, from alcohol before flight. Um, but yes, it's about consistency. So people know you that, uh, know you as that, like wherever she is, she posts her drink in her passport. This is Jordan. Oh, she's about to tell us something cool. There goes the drink. There goes the Something's beer. Something's happening. Another trip <laughs> yeah. is coming up. Um, yep. Yeah, I think, I think it is about, and it's about using those pillars, consistently talking about it. But also I think the really tricky thing for content creators is how to talk about those things in new and interesting ways and how to show mm -hmm. those things in new and interesting ways. Like, and that's part of the really challenging part of being in a creative field at all. Um, so it's not necessarily veering off of those topics so much as showing them in a new light. Um, or even like one of the big things that I don't know how I feel about this, just as a creator and a creative, you know, I, I've, for me personally, discovered that one of the biggest things that you can do on IG Reels or with TikTok is like jump on those trends, like from the outset. Um, I had, I found an audio that I liked um, and I just did like, a five second clip and it went viral on Reels. So just leave it to Instagram to be like, the thing that you spend zero time on is gonna go viral. And then things that you spend like an hour on and edit over and over again, you're gonna get like mm -hmm. a thousand on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I put, that's the same for me on TikTok. I posted something that is not my niche at all is about credit cards. And I was like, oh, Capital Adventure X. And it has like 270,000 views. And like everyone's <laughs> arguing in the comments and I'm like, oh my God, this is not even my niche. What do I do? <laughs> so I've just been trying to capitalize on that. But um, I mean, TikTok could be, TikTok's a whole different presentation. <laughs> yeah, I always kind of want to throw like in my stories, which I prevent myself from doing. So I'm like a cat mom of three. And I always want to throw like a picture of my cat, you know, like when I come back, cause they're like suctioned to me everywhere for days after Aww. I come back from a trip. But then I'm like, it's not my brand, you know? I mean, maybe it should be. I mean, you can attract a slightly different audience, but I think it's the way you, like, the, like you say, the way you story tell, right? The way you weave it back in. Yeah, it could um, be like content pillar cat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's less risk, less risk with the story because it disappears after 24 hours, right? Versus something that lives on the popular page or in your feed. And that goes for any social media platform, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Sarah, Sarah mentioned a good, good crossover, like airport bar guides. That's really, it's really savvy. And yes, Kathy, uh, everyone who attended today or even just signed up will get a replay of this presentation. I've included Jordan's information in the chat as well. We still have a couple more minutes for, um, you know, any questions, any stories, any tips, uh, and we'll, we'll go through the, the end because I do love all of the comments and questions. Um, and I hope that there was enough content, <laughs> actual content. Maybe I went through it really fast and some stuff people just need to sit with. There's a lot of sort of homework assignment stuff in there, right? That stuff that you have to sit with and just write out and refine, um, and come back to, and, um, hopefully, um, oh, what is my number one piece of advice to new brands? Um, it's a good question. Why are you making me, why are you making me think it's Thursday? Um, honestly, I would, I would say have a brand strategy. I think that's the biggest thing is honestly outline, have a really clear idea of what it is you're trying to communicate right? Like what is your brand? What it is you're trying to communicate? Because you can go all over social media here, there, and everywhere and write a blog and do all of this stuff. But if it's all disconnected, you're sort of self-sabotaging, I guess is the best, you know, you're, you're not capitalizing on growth that you could have. Um, and you're just kind of throwing stuff out in the universe as opposed to having a um, really strategic focused approach. Actually, one of the 
um, best people I can think of that I think has done such a strategic focused approach. It's like laser focused. It's like so beyond the way my brain even functions is Christine Lozada with drones. Like she started. How did I know you were going to say Christine? Because she's one of my favorite too. (laughs) I knew you were going to say Christine. (laughs) Yeah. Her and I have been friends since back in the day. Um, and just her level of growth and her focus (laughs) is insane. Like it's another, it's like hashtag next level. Like my brain doesn't work that way, you know, but no, you have, you definitely have a strong brand. And I look up to both of you as, you know, leading wonderful. So, uh, Christine also hosts TNN events for everyone who doesn't know her. She, um, yeah, is a drone queen. She's great. She helps a lot of creators. She plays a lot on YouTube, Instagram's her side, TikTok's her side. She's, um, she's big on YouTube, but I think, yeah, we can all learn from both of you. It's always good to have a rabbit to chase, but I knew you were going to say Christine. Cause that's the first person I thought of too. Yeah. She's really, I mean, I could tell you everything about like anything and everything about like design or websites, branding, that kind of thing. But she like went and did the damn thing, you know, mm-hmm. like she went full on and she has a marketing background as well, like on mm-hmm. the network side. Um, so slightly mm-hmm. more analytical than like, um, my background, but with a creative. Yeah, I'm definitely yep. more on the creative side. <laughs> I'm working at right. those my paid gigs. Yeah, of course you are. <laughs> awesome. Well, if anyone else has any questions, you can throw them in the chat now. Um, otherwise, you know, if if you don't want to ask in front of everyone or it comes to you later, please feel free to reach out to Jordan. She's incredibly responsive, incredibly active. I'll drop her information in the chat again. Um, Lots of ways to connect with Jordan. And like we said, um, this is, you know, Tiana, or excuse me, the speakers do this out of the kindness of their heart. The best way to support them is by connecting with them any way you can. So Jordan, did you want to say anything else before I close out with a few of my TNN slides? Um, I just saw somebody said... Uh, the code for it's she's wonderful. Let me just drop this in really fast.com backslash join should be Washington DC as the promo code. There we go. Shouldn't be invalid. <laughs> I was probably just typing the site wrong in the chat. So apologies to everyone. And you can also save the chat down if you'd like to get any tips and advice from it. Three dots, bottom right hand corner. And Jordan, this was so wonderful. Thank you so much. I learned a lot and I'm, you know, I'm kind of an advanced, I like to call myself an advanced beginner. So (laughs) I always love hearing this stuff to reinforce what I know and to learn what I don't know really. And yes, everyone will get this presentation. That's super exciting. Hope you have a great weekend following 